Okay, good morning. How is everyone out there? Come on, come on, give me a little love. So 20, thank you, thank you. All right, it is so great to see everyone out here this morning. Thank you for being with us. You are in for a treat. I'm gonna get us started with our first video. Well, you need education to be the best I can be. Good education. My education. An education. The education. Helpful teachers, loving parents. I learn I'm on math problems and I learn stuff on math with partners. I get to do activities for other schools and get to learn more about the world. You get to learn. She picks me up when I go down. She always thinks positive of me. She she loves me as a student and she gives me work that's above my grade level. That they care for you and they're actually there and helping you throughout your issues. The students, they disrespectful. They don't care about another person's feelings or how they feel. They very disrespectful to the teachers. The thing I change about this school is like the classroom. I make it look more better than the way it looks. All right. So this morning we're going to tackle uh, education with an incredible panel, and I'm going to start off by introducing our moderator, who we're thrilled to have. Let me just tell you all, though, the format for today. Uh, our panelists have been asked to basically uh, distill their wisdom to seven minutes. So they will be going through and sharing pieces, uh, parts of their story, not their full story. We will have time at the end. We've saved, saved ample time at the end for questions. You all have little notebooks in front of you. Use them, please. Write down your questions so you don't forget them. Um, there'll be a break. We'll have three presenters, a break for some um, audience question, uh, swipe questions, and another three presenters. So with that, um, let me introduce you to Victoria Jackson. We're thrilled to have joined us from Policy Matters Ohio as a state uh, policy fellow in 2016 uh, with a focus on education policy. Victoria is also a select group of eight fellows with the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. Prior to Policy Matters, Victoria served in AmeriCorps with College Now Greater Cleveland doing college access advising. She's also worked with the Kerwin Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity um, at OSU and the Ohio Department of Education as a graduate assistant while attending the Ohio State University and obtaining a Master's of Public Administration. Victoria definitely has some ideas about education and equity, and we are thrilled to have her here as our moderator for this panel on the importance of education and child well being. Please welcome Victoria. Thank you. Good morning. It's great to see you all here and have a packed room. I hope you're all as excited for this panel as I am. If I weren't moderating, I would be in the audience with all of you. Um, today, we have a great panel of experts in different areas of education. They'll be talking about everything from addressing trauma in schools, the importance of creativity and play, the achievement gap, how housing insecurity and homelessness affects students, access to higher education, and looking at racial disparities in school discipline and special education. Um, when we, we talked about this a little earlier in the earlier session about the difference between equity and equality. And equality says that we all get the same thing regardless of need. But equity says those who need more get more. And when we think about a commitment to educational equity, that means meeting students where they are and providing them with what they need. Um, I'm a policy analyst. I do a lot of budget policy work looking at school funding. And of course, we want robust funding for all schools and all students. But one of the things we recognize in our work is that schools that serve larger numbers of low-income students Students with disabilities, students of color, and students for whom English is their second language, they need more funding so they can provide those in-school supports that research has shown will allow them to achieve at the same level as their more privileged peers. 
And so just to bring it back to some of the larger themes for the conference today, the Schubert Center has brought us all together to talk about nurturing the whole child and to think about the environment and context that children grow up in. And when I think about from a policy standpoint, what can we do to ensure that the environments that children have are conducive to their happiness and success to provide them with what they need? I think about having access to affordable and comprehensive medical care for children and their parents. I think about access to nutritious food. I think about access to ho stable housing that doesn't have lead, less violence and fewer guns. And I think about well-paying jobs so parents can support their children. And we also have to talk about those structural barriers. We need to end those things so that harms children like white supremacy and other systems of oppression so children that and deny them opportunities. And so I'm sure our panelists are happy they don't have to tackle all of those issues in the seven minutes that they're given, but we do have, they will be providing with great information in their areas. So you can understand what are some of those barriers and opportunities for increasing educational opportunity. And so now I'm going to turn it over to our excellent panelists. And I'm going to introduce our first three panelists. First, we have Dr. Gregory Hutchings, superintendent of Shaker Heights Schools, and his pre panel, his presentation will be on education as our modern day civil rights struggle. Next, we have Dr. Sandy Russ, a professor of psychology at Case Western Reserve University, and she'll be talking about ways to foster imagination, creativity, and play in classroom settings. And then we have Melissa Swiegel Smith, a CMSD teacher at the Cuyahoga County Juvenile Detention Center, and she'll be to her panel is titled Seeds of Hope, Trauma-Informed Teaching in a Juvenile Detention Center. So to give a round of applause for our first group, and thank you. All right, I felt like I needed to run up here because it's like we have seven minutes to talk. It's like You can't tell an educator, you only have seven minutes. So first, let me just say thank you, but I'm going to stick to it because I saw you have signs and everything that says stop. Uh, so I don't, want, I don't want to be that person. I first want to thank the Schubert Center just for hosting this. I mean, I think this is so wonderful for us to be able to talk about this very important topic of education. And my, my topic for today, it really speaks for itself. Education as our modern day civil rights struggle. I mean, we are struggling right now across this country, especially in public education. And there is something that we have to do about it. If I had all the answers for you all, trust me, I would not be just standing here talking to you. I would be on today, the, the Today Show and everything else um, speaking all over this, this country. Uh, but I'm hopefully going to give you just a few tidbits that you can take back to your communities. You know, the big elephant in the room is race. It is something that we are fearful to talk about. It's something that makes people uncomfortable. And one term that I constantly use is that nobody in this country has the right to be comfortable. So you need to be uncomfortable. And we have to be able to talk about the fact that, you know, race, when you add that to anything in this country, when you add race to poor, and when you add race to LGBTQ, when you add race to uneducated, race just makes it even more complicated. And it's because it is a very complicated topic. You know, almost every aspect of our challenge, it has something to do with race. You know, almost 64 years ago, how many people know about Brown v. Board of Education? I hope everybody in this room can raise your hand, right? Uh, the anniversary is coming up, 64 years. May 17th, 1954 was when first Brown, Brown 1, was passed. Brown 2 was passed. How many people know about Brown 2? And that said, you know, Brown 1 talked about separate but equal. Brown too stated with all deliberate speed. What we forget is that most of our countries, I'm sorry, most of our school districts across this country, they didn't integrate their schools until the 70s, 20 years after the Brown v. Board of Education decision. And I'm using Shaker Heights as one example. 20 years later, we pride ourselves on having involuntary, uh, or I'm sorry, voluntary integration uh, within our schools, but it was 20 years after the fact. We don't have that discussion in our classrooms. We don't have that discussion in our communities. And the simple fact that today our classes and our schools are still separate as well as inequitable, inequitable is an issue. You know, we were fighting for separate but equal. Now it's inequities that we're faced with. We have buildings as African-American children in these African-American communities, particularly in our major urban cities. You're going to find, you know, all black schools that have brand new schools, brand new books, teachers who are running those schools who are certified. However, you can still find dilapidated buildings in our urban districts. 
You can still find our schools that are segregated because of homing or because of housing uh, regulations or because of where people choose to live in our neighborhood patterns. You know, we are still one of the most segregated places in this world, right here in the United States of America. And all you have to do is go into our urban communities to see that. Even in our communities that are diverse, and I'm going to use Shaker Heights as an example, we have the diversity in our community, but we still can walk into our school, our one high school, and find an all African American classroom and an all African American, I'm sorry, an all white classroom in 2018. That's an issue. That's a problem that we're not willing to talk about and to face. And of course, I can't do it by myself. So I need people like you all in this audience who woke up early this morning to come out to hear people speak about different topics to stand up and do something because our kids are counting on us. You know, the simple fact that you can still find low rigor in many of our classrooms. You know, it's not about, and I, I said this to somebody recently, you know, I wouldn't complain as much if we had all African-American classrooms that were high performing. I would say, you know, there's not, because I support HBCUs. That's just like a mini HBCU. The issue is that we have all African-American classrooms where it's low rigor, low expectations, students feeling as if they are less than, they're being oppressed. And as they go through that year after year, they grow up and they become adults who feel like they don't deserve to be at the table. That is the problem. So we have to find ways to make sure that we're encouraging our young people, making sure that they feel that they are empowered, that they have people who are going to stand behind them and that we're going to continue to stand on the shoulders of people who stood up for us. I would not be standing here today if it weren't for all the people who paved the way for me, like Ms. Nelson, who I talked to earlier today, Ms. Nelson. So thank you, 80 years old. I'm like, go ahead. You know, I'm not going to talk about politics. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but I can tell you that the current administration right now has some challenges and some issues that we need to start fighting against. You know, sometimes we don't exercise our right to vote. If we have people who are making these decisions that are not in the best interest of young children, we have the power to change that. Let's start exercising our rights to vote. You know, our problem right now is that our lawmakers, a lot of them think that they're educators and they're not. They're making decisions for our young people, especially for public education. There's a lot of rhetoric around the fact that public education is doing a disservice to young people. But I think America's doing a disservice to young people in public schools. That's what's happening. We have to speak up and speak out about that. We have to make sure that we have lawmakers. I have one minute. Wow. Jeez. I didn't get through all my slides. We have to make sure that our lawmakers are making the right decisions and that, you know, things like this state report card that we have right here in the state of Ohio, that what it's doing is tearing our school districts apart. It's tearing our, our communities apart. It's looking at one particular measurement to determine whether you are A, B, C, D, or F. But we can't define what proficiency is. When somebody, we say a student is proficient, ask the state, well, what does that mean? And they will not be able to tell you that. Ask them, how did you come up with an A, B, C, or D, or an F for a school district like Shaker Heights, where 93% of our kids are graduating and going to college? Still got a lot of room to grow, but that doesn't sound like a D to me. So we need to make sure that we're advocating and we're speaking up for that. I also want to say, finally, because I know my time is up uh, and I didn't get to get through all my slides, I want to talk about the fact that equity Equity and excellence. A lot of people think that they cannot go hand in hand, and they have to. Let me get to that. The fact that you know you don't have to take something away from one to give to the other. And if we don't find a way to speak up and to be advocates and to say that excellence and equity can be under the same roof, that they actually go hand in hand. The fact that the opportunity hoarding that continues to happen in all of our school districts across this country, and look up John, um, John Diamond and Amanda Lewis, and look up their book to talk to read about opportunity hoarding. I, I strongly encourage you to do that. But I'm gonna stop because seven minutes went by so well, fast. I was fired up. I just got started. <laughs> Good morning. 
uh, my topic is ways to foster imagination, creativity, and play in classroom settings. And first of all, pretend play is important and useful in the classroom in two ways. One, through play, we can identify creative potential in children. And two, we can develop creative processes in children through the vehicle of pretend play. Pretend play is when children make things up from scratch, right? They make things up, they use fantasy, make believe, tell stories, act it out so it's involving the whole child. They express emotion in the play narrative. And um, also, they treat objects as if they were something else, right? So Legos can be a milk bottle, a fire engine, uh, whatever they want it to be. I'll deal with it. You keep talking. Okay. I need the slide. <laughs> Thank you. So pretend play uh, is unique in childhood because it's a natural activity. It's universal. It, it occurs in all cultures starting about two and a half years of age. It's self-generating. Children are making things up from scratch. That's so important. It's self-reinforcing. It's fun. So in that sense, children are wired to engage in pretend play. They want it for typical children. They want to keep going back to it. And it involves the whole child. It's, it's open-ended. In our research program at Case, uh, myself and many graduate students over the last many years <laughs> uh, have studied pretend play in children. We can measure children's imagination in play. And with children from 6 to 10, we use puppets and blocks and have them play for five minutes. And we videotape the play and code it for imagination and storytelling ability and amount of emotion in the play. And for younger children, four or five-year-olds, uh, we give them more toys and a little more structured instructions. But we can also uh, score their ability uh, to be imaginative. So what have we learned from our research program? First of all, that we can measure creative ability through pretend play, that children who are creative in play are also creative on other measures of creativity independent of IQ. And this is really important. This is not what our IQ tests are measuring. The creative abilities are separate from intelligence, and they are a resource for children in addition to intelligence. And also, kind of go back, um, the association between pretend play and creativity is stable over time. So we can see, we've done this in two studies now, in young children, first, second, third grade, if they're creative in play, and we go back four years later, they're more creative on uh, creativity measures, other creativity measures, independent of IQ. So early play is predictive of creativity over a four-year period and over a seven-year seven period. Uh, we've also learned that we, with brief interventions, uh, five sessions, 20 minutes, where an adult plays with a child, engages with them, we can help them become more creative in the play. We've done this in Cleveland Public School. We've done it at, at Laurel Private School. We can help them become more creative in play. And for some children, it transfers to other measures of, of creativity. Play in the classroom. Uh, we can use play assessment to identify creative potential and giftedness in children. Many children are being missed because giftedness or talent is really um, focused mainly on IQ scores. And a lot of children have many creative abilities, but they're not being identified. And pretend play is one way to identify these other abilities. You can integrate play experiences into the classroom, not just in preschool or kindergarten, but first, second, even third grade. Both individual and group play can be helpful 
In one of our studies, we had small groups of children, kind of mixed levels of ability, and these children became more creative in their play. And the presence of an adult to guide and model the play is helpful, and other researchers have, have found this to be true. So tips for classroom pretend playtime, unstructured toys, inexpensive <laughs> toys, Legos, dolls, blocks, action figures, stuffed animals, cars, trucks. Also, easy to guide play with story stems, right? Make up a story about whatever seems age appropriate for the child. Play with the child or children, but follow their lead. And there are a number of prompts that adults can give, and we've learned this from our research studies. Children really respond well to modeling, right? So just modeling with a block, that this red block could be a fire engine. It's almost teaching pretend. Um, or also having the child make up different kinds of stories or put on a different ending to help develop this cognitive flexibility, which is so important in problem solving later on, being flexible in, in your approach. Uh, small groups of children, they're also developing social skills <laughs> as well as creative skills. They learn from each other. Children model for each other. And use other media uh, to incorporate into the play, such as drawing, photography, um, uh, video. I observed a really exciting new uh, exhibit uh, at one of the Lego museums where they had some Legos, other props, for the child to pretend and play with. And then they could also film their play and, and in essence, take it home with them. And this is the kind of creative thing that can be done in the classroom. We're doing a study right now at Head Start, Lewis Stokes Head Start Center, where we're trying to help these children become more imaginative in play. We can see their joy. There are a lot of creative children here. And the challenge to the school system is to help continue nurturing this creativity and joy as the years go on. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Melissa Marini Schwiegel Smith. It is an honor to be here today among such an esteemed group of speakers and guests, and an honor to be on this land once inhabited by the Iroquoian speaking Erie people. Last spring, I was downtown with my then 17 year old son after an event at the Wolstein Center. I was on East 18th Street debating with him whether or not it was safe for him to walk about two blocks to his car alone in the dark. He injected this jarring reminder into our conversation. Mom, he said, I look like the monster other people are afraid of. Don't worry about me. <laughs> My thoughtful, polite, kind, intellectual, dedicated son is over six feet tall with keen brown eyes and beautiful brown skin. He could be mistaken for any number of the students I greet in class each day, and none of them are monsters. Four years ago, I was about to quit teaching entirely. I felt my profession and creativity had been stolen from me. I felt policymakers were neglecting or ignoring the fact that teaching is always first about relationships. I didn't become a teacher to drill and kill kids with facts in order to improve data and numbers for adults. Knowing my mindset, the principal of the school at the Cuyahoga County Juvenile Detention Center encouraged me to apply for an open position there, promising me that what is best for kids would come first. I am still employed by the Cleveland Metropolitan School District, but I work at the County Juvenile Detention Facility, which services students from throughout Cuyahoga County. CMSD is responsible for the student's education because the center is located at 9300 Quincy Avenue in Cleveland. Most people, even many who work within CMSD, are not aware that a school exists at the Juvenile Detention Center. National advocacy groups have described kids in schools and juvenile detention centers as an invisible population. Over 1,000 kids ages eight, to 21, passed through CCJDC each year, with an average stay of two to three weeks. There is a lot of recidivism. For example, over half of the kids at CCJDC right now are on their second stay. Over half also have mental health needs or diagnosed disability. Trauma in their lives and the community and the trauma of being incarcerated all have a huge impact on the kids' ability to focus and learn. 
Places like detention centers are not organically designed for the implementation of social and emotional learning, nor are they structured with the awareness of trauma. I am fortunate to have the principal who hired me four years ago. I am encouraged to be creative in the classroom again and to integrate a culturally relevant critical pedagogy. At the detention center, I am able to focus on what is best for students. This includes their social and emotional development as well as their academics. So we started today in my class with our daily gratitude statement because of the benefits found in research and to insert a modicum of positivity in a very negative space. I also teach students the 478 breathing method to help them with anxiety and difficulty sleeping. We reflect on our performance each day and students are given an opportunity to share with me any thoughts or feelings they may be having. In my classroom, I've been able to incorporate push path claws, stress balls, therapy putty, a bike desk, and aromatherapy. We also set short-term goals to think about how to get to our long-term goals. I'm able to teach the value of having a growth mindset, but I'm also able to give students opportunities for success. With all kinds of numbers around testing and discipline and data approaches that neglect the humanity of children, students often bear the burden of labels like failing. The discouragement and frustration my students have experienced in schools because schools are not designed funded or encouraged by current accountability systems to include them and care for them is society's scandal, and we all pay the consequences. Schools are the windows and mirrors of a community. They reflect and provide insight into what and who is valued in that community. It also takes a community to raise a child. We can't expect schools or police officers to do it all for us. I realized early in my career that not only do our students need exposure to the world out there that awaits them, but our community needs exposure to who our students really are. It is hard not to love the kids once you get to know them. I've been able to collaborate with dozens of community groups throughout my 20 years of teaching, thanks to the generosity of an innovation grant I received from the Novo Foundation and Phil Rockefeller Philanthropic Foundation the past two years. I've been able to integrate art, service learning, and social and emotional learning with a community partner who finds local, national, and international artists to engage in interactive projects with my students at the detention center. Changing the proximity of people in our community from one in which they tell our kids what they need from a distance to a position that allows for them to listen to what our kids have to say about their needs and desires has changed narratives and raised new questions. What happens when you make school about living life instead of just a place to learn how to make a living? From this city, among my students, <laughs> whom city leaders seem to want to leave behind and forget, is a resilience, brilliance, and insatiable desire to express gratitude and give generously. In compassionate and trauma-informed classrooms, the child is the focus and school becomes a place they want to be. Every child should be able to hold a seed of hope and every school should have the resources and ability to help plant it. The inequities and injustices in our society and country began long before any of us arrived here and will take a lot of time and effort to remedy. If we want to be a community committed to all of our children, we must embrace courage and navigate the discomfort and guilt that accompanies an honest examination of the way in which we treat our most vulnerable young people. Desmond Tutu said, my humanity is bound up in yours, for we can only be human together. I hope that all of you have a place that connects you to the humanity of others, like I found at the Juvenile Detention Center. And I hope one day all of our schools can be places that acknowledge and honor the humanity and art that exists within real teaching and learning. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hutchings, Dr. Russ, and Ms. Swiegel-Smith for your informative presentations. And now we'd like to hear from all of you in the audience. Um, we'll be doing some interactive polling questions. And if you go to the link on the screen on your phone or other internet connected device, then we can start answering these questions. Thank you. Oh, the link is also on your tables. So I'll give you a chance to do that. And if you don't have a phone or other device, you can also talk with your neighbor about your responses. So it's meant to be interactive and connect. Okay. So the first question is, what do you wish there was more time for in K through 12 classrooms? Applied learning, social emotional and relationship building, fundamentals in a subject area, civic engagement, and more in depth assessment. Yes. <laughs> and career and or higher education planning. 
Right. So you can read them, these that is, are appearing as, it's, as we're reading uh, since it's not. Right happening. now, we have 25 votes and 14 are for social, emotional, and relationship building. We have six for applied learning. And then we have two for civic engagement, now two for fundamentals in the subject area, and then one for career and our higher education planning. So, so sorry, we're, this is part of our learning here, but we'll go on to the next question. And these are supposed to be appearing up on the screen. But they're not. That's so weird. Maybe if we... They're not. OK. So for the second question, how confident are you that Cleveland ensures all of our children are educated for a future of possibility? Very confident. Very confident that we are at least on the right path. Somewhat confident that we are on the right path. Not confident that we are on the right path. There we go. Okay. And then the final is, believe we are headed in the wrong direction. So we have 30 votes currently. So right now, somewhat confident that we're on the right, oh, you can see that has the most votes. <laughs> and then not confident that we are on the right path is in second, a close second. So I think we have all of our votes for that question. And our next question, among the numerous challenges facing educators today, which would you say is among the most critical in order to best address the needs of our students? Teaching children with trauma slash behavioral issues, preparing students for success beyond testing, ensuring all children can access a quality education, prioritizing funding for education, keeping up with technology, and showing value of public education in a democracy. As you can see right now, number three, ensuring all children can access a quality education is the top vote. We have about a little over 30 votes in. Okay. I think we'll head on to the next question. Do students have enough exposure to art, diverse cultural perspectives, and our activities that foster play, critical thinking, and creativity? Yes, no, and these are critical to academic success. No, but other education aspects are more important. Look, okay, clear winner. <laughs> a... <laughs> to the next one. Next, what do you think are the biggest barriers to students in Cleveland accessing higher education? The high cost of college and inadequate financial aid, low expectations, lack of college readiness, or lack of knowledge about the college access process? And looks like lack of college readiness is winning right at the moment. We'll see when we get a little over 30. All right. So, look, yeah, lack of college readiness it is. No? Oh, it's close. Okay. All right. I think, is that, I think that is our last. Is that the last question? All right, I thank you. That is our last question. So we all have an idea of the pulse check in the room and see where we're all thinking and where our heads, at, heads are at. And so now I'm going to introduce our next group of presenters. We have Danielle Godomsky, a staff attorney at the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland. Her panel is titled Seeking Racial Equity in School Discipline and Special Education. We have Marjorie Glick, Manager of Partnerships and Programs at the Higher Education Compact of Greater Cleveland. Her panel is titled, The Path to College, Raising Expectations for All Cleveland Students. And then we have Dr. Marsha Zashin, Director of Project Act at CMSD, The Hidden Side of Childhood. Thank you, welcome Danielle. I recently met 10-year-old Raymond when he was living at a shelter with his mother and younger sister after leaving their violent father. 
Raymond is a sweet and outgoing young man. He has a reading disability, and although he's repeating the third grade, he had troubles um, identifying sight words. He's also diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder due to the violence he witnessed in his home. He has an individual education program, or IEP, which provides special education services for his reading and behavioral struggles. Raymond has been suspended or expelled for 32 school days this year. Because he's a student with a special education program, before he could be expelled, his IEP team had to meet to consider whether his behaviors were related to his disability. He was expelled because he has constant conflicts with the school resource officer. When the officer recently grabbed his book bag, Raymond pushed him back, and he was expelled for 45 days. <laughs> the team met to determine whether his behavior was related to his disability, and if it was related to his disability, he wouldn't be expelled and proper supports would be put in place. But his team decided his behavior was not related to his disabilities. I wasn't in the room, but I can imagine how the conversation may have gone. Was the behavior related to his reading disability? No. Could Raymond have made a different choice in the situation? Yes. Does Raymond know better than to push an adult? Yes. I can imagine how the conversation may have gone because as an attorney with the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland, I've been in hundreds of school meetings where we consider whether a child's behavior is related to their disability or whether just because they're bad kids. I argue in the language of disability because the law protects children with disabilities. But really, my aim is to get the school to see the child as a whole child and to understand the reasons behind their behavior. So Raymond is a student with a reading disability, but he also reacts instinctively because of his PTSD. Another student, 16-year-old Javon, stares out the window all day because he's often replaying the three separate deaths he's witnessed. 12-year-old Anthony tells his teachers, I don't have to listen to what you say, I'm gonna be gone soon, because his ADHD has led to constant suspensions and two expulsions before the sixth grade. Eight-year-old Jerry can watch his teacher all day long, but can't complete any of the homework because he was lead poisoned as a child. 11-year-old Tariq has big emotions and doesn't know how to handle them because he's placed in a different foster home than his siblings, and he only gets to see his mom once a week. I can tell the school all of these facts. I can sometimes show them a diagnosis on paper, but it doesn't always change the way a school views the child. Partly that's because some of our school staff and administrators don't understand the effect of trauma and disabilities on our children. Behavioral and emotional disabilities are part of the special education law, but I constantly hear, he has really high academic scores. He can't have a disability. Um, there are also, um, <laughs> um, mental health professionals are clear that uh, trauma and disabilities are not the same across all settings and are often triggered by different things for different children. But at least once a week I hear, he was listening last week, he must be choosing when to listen. Another part is that we're making decisions about children in the context of racial stereotypes. It's no coincidence that every child but one that I mentioned earlier is a black boy. I represent families and children of all races and genders, but the most misunderstood are our black boys. And children of color in general are more often described as aggressive, defiant, and unwilling to learn. So for Raymond, we were able to appeal his expulsion and get him back in school with the proper supports. And for each individual child that comes to us for help, we'll try to change that child's story with the school. But here are some ways we can shift the bigger narrative. First, stop excluding children from school as a punishment. Suspensions and expulsions do not modify behavior. They disproportionately affect students of color, students who live in poverty, and students with disabilities. Removing a child from school is the quickest way for overburdened teachers or administrators to deal with a problem, but often the kids come back to the same setting, they're further behind in school, and neither the teacher nor the student has new ways to address the behavior. Second, we have to ensure that teachers and administrators understand and have the tools to address trauma, disabilities, and the toxic stress of poverty. 
Trauma-informed is a buzzword these days, but really it's about training to understand where are our children coming from and how, do they, how does that affect their time in the classroom. There are lots of curriculum that local schools are already using to build social and emotional skills, um, but nothing can replace special education services or mental health access when it's needed. There's a national conversation around disproportionate number of students of color in special education services. And when special education is an automatic separation from other students or lowered expectations, that's absolutely a cause for concern. But special education can also be well-placed supports aimed at keeping kids in school, and that should be accessible to every child. Third, we have to discuss racial biases in school. A recent study by the United States Government Accountability Office found that black boys make up 15.5% of our public school students and account for 39% of our suspensions and 30% of our expulsions. The first way to address implicit bias is to recognize the existence and effect of it and training on that and also um, exposing ourselves to new ways of thinking and ideas. Positive behavior supports, when they're implemented, don't close that racial gap. And the racial gap can't be accounted for simply by looking at poverty, attitudes towards education, or um, the severity of the offense. So we need to expose ourselves to new ways of thinking about our students and discuss the effect of race in our decision making. None of these decisions or policies are easy or quick, but if we want to change the way that our children grow and build a more equitable society, we have to keep kids in school and ensure that the schools are a place that understand them. Thank you. Hi, I'm Margie Glick, and I'm with the Higher Education Compact, and I'm really honored to be on such an esteemed panel. Uh, the Higher Education Compact is a collective impact convener that was launched by Mayor Frank Jackson in 2011 to address the low post-secondary attainment rates in Cleveland. The compact itself consists of 40 community partners and 16 higher education partners, and really tries to, you know, be an example of why it takes a community to get Cleveland students to and through college, and really any student to and through college. So my presentation is going to provide a brief overview as to why post-secondary attainment is important, and also why uh, the compact has worked so closely with CMSD to try to increase these rates over the past six years. So college matters, and I'm going to say College, as the you know, defined as anything beyond a post-secondary, uh, excuse me, anything beyond a high school diploma. So that could be a certificate, that could be an associate's degree, that could be a bachelor's degree. Those with some education beyond high school have higher incomes over annually and over the course of their lifetimes. They also have longer life expectancies. This is because having some education is associated with uh, not smoking the better diet, with more exercise, and also with having a higher likelihood of having health insurance that goes along with your job. Uh, these same college-going individuals are less likely to end up in prison, are less likely to be unemployed, and are less likely to live in poverty. Unfortunately, Cleveland's post-secondary attainment rate lags the state and nation. At just about one in four adults having some education beyond high school, this is far below what is expected what the, the state expects our community will need by 2020. Specifically, by 2020, it's expected that 65% of jobs will require some education beyond high school. This statistic alone reflects the changing need of employers and is one of the many reasons why it's important to get more students on this path to and through college. So what why why are why is attainment so low in Cleveland? One reason for this is that for a very long time, few Cleveland students were on this post-secondary path. Um, of CMSD's graduating class of 2007, and yes, this is a bit dated uh, data, uh, only 15% made it through college six years after high school. Um, this chart in front of you doesn't even address the fact that in 2011, when the compact started, 
barely one in two students was even graduating from high school. So those statistics are going to lead to pretty low attainment overall. Now at least uh, three in four Cleveland students are going to college. Unfortunately, enrollment is actually going down a bit. Um, but for those students, once they get to school, they are increasing graduation rates. So this is clearly, there are some really strong equity issues when it comes to college going and college completion. Uh, this slide, very briefly, um, shows that if you are wealthy, your odds of having some sort of college degree by the time you're 24 are significantly higher than if you are poor. And this doesn't have to do with academic preparedness or abilities. This is, in fact, if you are a high achieving, low income student, you're less likely to graduate from college than if you're a low achieving, high income student. Again, the, the breakdowns based on race and ethnicity are just as stark. Uh, uh, and, are, and this, again, shouldn't be surprising that Cleveland as a whole has a low post-secondary attainment rate, that uh, the Cleveland Public School District is 84% uh, non-white. So what are we doing in Cleveland to put all students on a path to college and success once they are in school? Um, we're really focused on using, it's a uh, data-driven decision-making. It's really more so data-informed decision-making. Uh, each year, uh, my organization publishes an annual report that uses key indicators to try to anticipate, that, that are intended to anticipate whether a student is ready for college. If they go to college, will they be successful? And then once they're enrolled, will they actually graduate on time? Because it's no longer just enough to have some college or to get into school. You really need to complete that degree if you want the full benefits of, of not only the time of you spent in college, but also the, the debt that tends to come with higher education these days. And I was not surprised to see that, for many of you, that you kind of cited that affordability you thought was one of the major barriers to college going and completion. And I'm happy to address that more in the Q&A. So in addition to using data to try to provide some transparency around this information, because you can't start having conversations around equity if you don't know what the kind of the story is behind the, you, you don't know what the, you can't tell the story um, without knowing the, the numbers that are out there and being able to track that progress over time. But we also use that data that we're able to, to now uh, review to do specific initiatives that help students while still in school. So we are able to tell you what students are doing well on the ACT. We can tell you what students are almost college ready as defined by their ACT. And we can then help teachers and help counselors work more directly with those students to get them to retake the ACT and prepare for it and be on a, a more direct path to college, going in college success. The compact also works really closely with uh, the Cleveland public schools to do district-wide initiatives. For far too long, college was seen as something that was an expectation for certain students, for the really high achieving students, to the students who have shown a specific amount, you know, specific interest in it. Now we have moved that model to be something that's encompassing to all students. There are annual district-wide events that relate to financial aid, that relate to college applications. And we pull in a lot of our community partners and our higher education partners to try to create the stronger college-going culture. So again, all students feel as though they are able to go to college because they are able to go to college. And if they want to go, there is a path for them to be successful. We also work really closely with all these wonderful community-based partners. And some of you are in the room today to really make sure that no student falls in through the cracks. There's a lot of pressure on teachers, and, then, and there's not always the capacity of teachers to work with every student on their college-going plans. Same with counselors. They have very, very large caseloads. So community partners can often fill in the gaps where the school might not be able to. Our community partners also then learn kind of best practices around college going and, and knowing how to have specific conversations with students about financial aid in the college application process. And finally, we work with our higher ed partners to make sure that once students are enrolled, they have the support they need to be successful. And through these efforts, it's our hope that we can create a stronger culture in Cleveland and get more students on a path to and through school.
Good morning. Uh, I'm so pleased. Whoops. It started too fast. Let's just let it go. And then we'll they carry their possessions. These are the pictures Sorry, we know. And so when we picture homeless people, we tend not to think of children. Children are and yet, at any given time in the city, there are three times more homeless children and young than adults. They are difficult to see, but they tend to look like any other child or youth. However, they are not the same. Their lives of insecurity and uncertainty lead to struggles to attend school, progress in school, and finish school. But for homeless children, school might be the only place of safety and security and the only path out of homelessness. And so, it is critical that our homeless students are identified, enrolled in school, and connected to services and support as soon as possible. The most critical step in helping homeless students is identification. And so, understanding homelessness and the rights of homeless children and youth become essential. The McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistant Act passed by Congress in 1987 and recently reauthorized under ESSA, the Every Student Succeeds Act, is a federal law that requires state and local educational agencies to review and revise laws, regulations, practices, or policies that may interfere with the identification, enrollment, attendance, or success in the education of homeless students. McKinney-Vento defines homeless children and youth as individuals who lack a fixed regular and adequate nighttime residents, including children whose families share the home of other persons, sometimes referred to as doubled up, live in motels, hotels, trailer parks, or campgrounds due to the lack of alternative adequate accommodations, live in emergency or transitional shelters, have a primary nighttime residence that is a public or private place not meant to be used as a regular sleeping accommodation or live in cars, parks, public spaces, abandoned buildings, substandard housing, bus or train stations, or similar settings. Unaccompanied youth, children and youth from infancy to 18 years old, are those not in the physical custody of a legal guardian and living in any of those conditions. Of course, there are many reasons why a family or child may become homeless. The loss of permanent housing, running away from a violent or dangerous situation, including domestic violence, being rejected from a family and told to leave, or natural or man-made disasters, such as floods and fire. Children whose lives are disrupted by homelessness often experience an interruption in their education. They might not have important documents, birth certificates, school and immunization records, transportation, clothing, or school supplies or they simply might be affected by the stigma of homelessness. It is the goal of McKinney-Vento to keep homeless students in school and to keep their education continuous and intact. With this goal in mind, McKinney-Vento directs school districts to appoint a local liaison whose job it is to ensure homeless students are identified, enrolled, and given a full and equal opportunity to succeed in school. A liaison serves as the primary contact between homeless families and school staff, district personnel, and service providers. Now, many communities have a homeless liaison that perhaps serves a handful of families each year. However, in larger cities, like Cleveland, the demand for help is far greater. In Cleveland, the homeless liaison serves all children and youth in the Cleveland Metropolitan School District's Project Act with a department of 14 that serves over 2,500 students a year, and a department that goes above and beyond the basic mandates of the McKinney-Vento Act. With offices at 1111 Superior Avenue, Project Act works with CMSD schools, Cleveland area shelters, and local agencies to identify, register, and enroll homeless students, arranging school assignments and transportation services and keeping students in their school of origin if that is in the best interest of the student and requested by the parent. Hundreds of families will visit Project Act this year to enroll their students in school. Many families need assistance in locating missing documents, 
learning about their rights, providing their students with the necessities for schools, and learning about additional services in CMSD in Cleveland. All of this happens at Project Act. In addition, Project Act offers an array of further services. Employing and training nine life skill coaches who work with students pre-K through grade 12. Helping with academic guidance and social and emotional issues. Project Act life skill coaches are in schools and are dedicated to helping their students be successful in school and in life. Providing a 24-hour helpline for shelter providers to connect homeless students with Project Act. Offering programs for early childhood, school age, and adolescents at area sites, incorporating homework assistance, tutoring, and educational enrichment and support services. Supporting identification and referral of special needs children for early childhood screening and intervention services. Offering career and vocational assessments for teens. Creating staff development workshops for district personnel focusing on the needs of homeless children and youth. And producing an interactive literacy program for homeless families which shares and promotes the joy of reading. The reading company is presented monthly at Playhouse Square and has been attended by over a thousand students a year who each receive a book after each performance. We see homeless people on the street, but for 25 years, CMSD's Project Act has searched beyond the streets to help those who are most vulnerable, the homeless children and youth of Cleveland, all who deserve a free and appropriate education with all barriers removed. Project Act ensures that Cleveland's homeless students are identified, enrolled, and given a full and equal opportunity to succeed in school. For education is the key that will prevent them from becoming homeless as adults. We started a little early, so I wasn't able to introduce the, um, the video. We thought that it would be easier to spend our seven minutes with this video so that you could understand uh, what homeless children need to go through in order to get to school. In many school districts, there are lots of barriers for students to enroll immediately. In Cleveland, we enroll our students within 24 hours. And in this room, there are several of our life skill coaches that you saw in the video. And without the life skill coaches that we have, we wouldn't have the wonderful program that we're able to implement. The one thing that I do want to stress is that when we work with our homeless students, we work with them as if they were our own children. We wouldn't do anything different with our own children than we do with the homeless children that we have. So thank you for letting us share awareness about the over 2,500, 3,000 students we will be serving this year. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Godomsky. Thank you, Ms. Glick. And thank you, Dr. Zashin, for your presentations. We're now going to move into the questions section. I will kick things off with a couple questions of my own, and then things will be opened up to the audience. So my first question is to the entire panel is, what policies do you want state policymakers to implement to support education for children in Cleveland? Whoever wants to start can start. I think one of the great things is a lot of changes can be done at the school district level. So a lot of the things I suggested in terms of changing codes of conduct and um, responses to disciplinary events can be done at the local level. Um, and so I think we should stop excluding children from school. Um, but there is a bill currently in front of the Ohio Senate that would require positive behavior intervention supports and ban uh, suspensions and expulsions for pre-kindergartners to third grade. Great. Thank you. I would ask uh, our policy makers to uphold the unconstitutional funding uh, practices that we have in the state of Ohio. And that is, you know, we our schools are funded by levies that are passed in communities. And if you have communities where levies are not passed, the funds are not there to actually educate um, our young people, particularly in our poor cities throughout the state. So I ask that they, and it's already been unconstitutional, but we continue to practice that in the state of Ohio. So I, I advocate that we uphold that. Great, thank you. 
more programs for identifying create, creative children and gifted and talented programs. Um, I don't like the word gifted. <laughs> uh, we should come up with another word. But identifying creative children early and bringing them along. So more funding for those programs. Great. Mine is kind of specific. Um, since December of 2015, I have been trying to get the county to educate students that are transferred or adjudicated to the adult county facility from the juvenile facility. Um, a lot of those students have active IEPs um, under the individual's with Disabilities and Education Act, and it is a violation to not have those needs serviced unless they are done with, com have completed successfully school or um, are, they, they have to be serviced. There is no other or. They have to be serviced unless they successfully complete school. And so our county is violating their civil rights. I made a complaint with the US Department of Justice in 2015. They referred that complaint to the Office of Civil Rights under the US Department of Education. And the US Department of Education has had an open case for against multiple different parties because they can't figure out who to hold accountable. They've gone to the county. The county has said, we don't have a school, so we're not violating any rights at the jail facility for the adults. Um, the juvenile facility, we service students, obviously, with disabilities all the time. We are fully compliant, but it's the adult facility. I've gone to every member of county council. They've all ignored me. I've gone and seen Prosecutor O'Malley so he could make Sheriff Pinckney aware. We need access to those kids that are being held at the adult county facility. They adjudicate them as juveniles um, to the adult court so they are no longer granted the protections under juvenile justice system. And then they are denied education it's a federal law that they be serviced, their education needs are serviced, and they are not being serviced. And so they opened a case against the county. The county said, you know, we don't have schools, so we're not violating. They opened a case against CMSD. CMSD said we send letters to the county all the time saying we need access to these kids, and the county doesn't give it to us. So somebody needs to be held accountable, and those kids need access to education. <laughs> When it comes to college access and completion, the top issue that uh, the state can address for us is college affordability. Ohio ranks 45th in the nation on key metrics when it comes to families being able to afford their child or the child being able to afford their post-secondary degree. And the state of Ohio has not only slashed its one and only state need-based aid grant by more than half since 2008, but there's also been a uh, underinvestment in state support for higher education, which are, are the funds that go directly to public colleges and universities. So um, students end up then paying, you know, end, end up with a, a greater burden on their back. And we can't underestimate that, that the role that that burden plays on getting students not only to think that college is something that they can do, but also making sure that they make it through. I would like to see uh, the legislature um, mandate that every school, especially in the urban settings, have a social worker in, in the building and also a psychologist in the building. And both of these people should be there on a daily basis. Thank you. Those are all, yeah, you're all after my own heart. Those are all things that I'm very passionate about. And then my next question is, what in-school supports for students do you think would increase educational equity? And anyone can start off. Again, I would like to say that we need to have those social workers and psychologists on a daily basis. We can catch kids when they're very young and try to remediate a lot of the issues that may develop over the years because no one has intervened with the children while they're young. So. I think that um, it's really important that we do have in every school a social worker, a licensed social worker, a licensed clinical social worker, as a matter of fact, and a school psychologist to work with our children as they begin their schooling. I would say to get more students with a college-going mindset, you need more adults in the building having conversations with kids about 
their life after high school. It can't just be on the school counselor. It can't just be on the school principal. It has to be on all individuals in the school building to feel comfortable having those conversations and being able to help support students and their families. Um, it's usually that one adult that can get that student through high school and onto their kind of next next uh, step, next path. Um, and if uh, if you know, there's only two people in the building that feel like they can have those conversations, you're going to miss out on a lot of students. I really think those conversations about race have to be happening in the building and in the classrooms. Um, you know, when when a school implements positive behavior supports just across the board and they decrease discipline overall, it still doesn't get at that racial gap. So it really has to be about talking about having those hard conversations and realizing the, how the choices we each make are impacting that racial gap. I have a big long list, so I'm gonna go really fast. <laughs> uh, wraparound services for families on school sites, safe transportation to and from school, after school and before school activities on site, access to arts, music, foreign language, phys ed, recess, highly qualified career educators, not temps, reduce K to three class size to under 15, and then provide every K to three classroom teacher with a teacher's aid. Nurse, psychologist, counselor at every school, and then I also want uh, charter schools to be more accountable because over $136 million has gone from Cleveland to charter schools who often don't outperform Cleveland or they are barely getting a letter grade above. And we don't even know what those letter grades mean anyway. <laughs> so I agree with all of that. Plus, especially having mental health professionals in the schools at, at all ages. Uh, and I was then thinking about products. You know, what are the products that are important? And I... For young children, computers and Legos. <laughs> and if you could just have both, computers and Legos and people who can help children develop those skills, that would go a long way. And I would just say everything our esteemed panelists have said, in addition, um, I would say just making sure that we encourage and support our young people. Um, you know, our kids, as you can see right now, they are like the biggest advocates in the country right now on this whole gun violence. And we have to make sure that we are encouraging them and making sure that we're opening doors for them and removing all of those barriers that's causing the disparities in our schools. Now I'm turning it over to all of you. So please, yes, Ms. Johnson. Well, we have, there's oh, a student with a microphone, yeah. so we'll come she, to you. And she's in a burgundy top. We have two of them. Oh, and the great. Oh, oh, I thought she was saying the student was going to talk. Um, hi, my name is Merle Johnson. I'm a member of the State Board of Education. And um, first of all, thank you, Melissa. I love you. Um, no offense to the rest of the panel, but I don't. You know. um, but we have an election year coming up. And I don't really have a question, but I have a, a very strong request from everybody. Um, we have all of our state offices that are up for re-election. The governor appoints eight people to the State Board of Education. A lot of people don't know that. State Board has 11 elected members. I'm one of the elected members from District 11. Has eight appointed members. So. You need to think about who you're going to elect for governor. And also, when you talk about the state auditor, the auditor can audit charter schools. OK, so when we talk about accountability, trans uh, transparency, you need to think about who you elect for state auditor. The other offices are also extremely important. Secretary of State uh, deals with voting. Um, you know, we have a lot of voter suppression going on right now. So we need to take a look at who we're electing for Secretary of State. The attorney general is in charge of police training throughout uh, the state. Now, I know we're focusing on education when we talk about how our African-American boys function in school, a whole lot of that has to do with the constant profiling and mistreatment by some police officers. So I'm trying to just make a point that when you go to these, you need to go to these um, candidate forums and directly ask questions of these candidates, especially governor, about education and about the policies that need to happen. So I just wanted to stress the importance of involving yourself in these candidate forums where you can actually ask questions. I know I talked a long time, but you didn't say I had a time limit. OK. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Do we have another question? Do we have a question? Oh. 
Um, I just wanted to say that I don't think it's a coincidence as a woman that, and over 76% of teachers are women, that our leadership is often very patriarchal with a very colonizing imperialist mindset, and then often turning to capitalism and a profession that's supposed to be a humanity. So I not only encourage us to look at education issues when voting, but also as women and our allies, our male allies, to run for office. And if you can't run for office, then raise someone who will run for office. And that would be my son is running, is running for the Ohio House seat in the 16th district. And he's got me as his mom, so he's going to do education right if he gets there. All right, thank you. And our next question. Um, my name is Carolyn Steiner, and I'm, I'm a longtime advocate and educator. And I guess the one th thing that impresses me is um, I've read a lot about places where they've really made big changes. And I know there's Finland, and I know it's very homogenous. But the first thing they did was they got rid of standardized testing, and then they invested in their teachers. And teaching was a profession. And I feel like now all the solutions are, oh, I'm going to teach Carolyn how to do this, teach this test better. I mean, it's all about taking kids online into computers. It's all about all these other things rather than really investing in your teachers. And in Finland, they every teacher is trained to do special education. And so, so you don't have to have separate departments. So that way, you're saving a lot of money and you're having teachers address equity every day in the classroom. And then the other thing they do is they have time in the day for teachers to collaborate. And so it took for, for them a while to get rid of having a giant curriculum to shrinking it down to 10 pages because they had so invested in their teachers, they paid for them to get their masters, they had them work with a professor who was the master of the subject as well as pedagogy. So they recruited people, they paid them, you know, actually like the way we pay them, not that much more, but teachers were so happy with their profession because they could use their creativity, they could use their talent, and it's like we seem to move away from that, but I really think to make, t t teachers want to do well, but they are just like clobbered, this is the new curriculum, this is that, so why not invest in the people who want to do this and, you know, and then have these equity issues and have everything addressed, so I, I just want to go there at some point. a couple of years ago, and I was um, sad to hear that they are actually looking to um, to begin to have standardized uh, assessments in their country. Uh, and I was like, no, don't do it. Don't do it. Why are you doing this? Um, so they're probably almost there now, because I think there was a two-year plan when I was there. Um, I, I, I totally agree with you. I think that we need to make sure that our teachers have autonomy and that they're able to have that creativity in the classroom. But I do also believe that we have to have some standards that are in place. And the reason for the whole purpose in having this whole, you know, these standards across uh, states and in school districts is to make sure that students who may not have advocates at home, that they are learning what they need to learn each year. So I, you know, I'm a believer in the standards, right? I think that we need to have them so that we don't allow kids to fall through the cracks. But I do agree with you that we need to encourage and make sure that superintendents across this country are encouraging their teachers to still be creative. You know, international baccalaureate is one way. That's how we do it in Shaker Heights. Um, but that's not the only way. That's just really good, good teaching practices and making sure that kids are able to be engaged in that learning process, too. Can you get it? Oh, you got it? Oh, okay. I seem kind of out, buddy, holding, but I appreciate it. <laughs> Hi, my name is Doreen Birch, and I do advocacy in a program called Life Obstacles in the Cleveland Metropolitan Schools. And what we do, we help our teachers to identify our children by putting them in a group setting where they put anything they want to talk about in a basket. And in that basket, we bring their issues and we take to address them to help them more graduate. At John Niles High School is where we are currently with our Life Obstacle team. We, at, out of our program, we had 11 seniors that were girls. They were failing. When academically, when we start addressing their needs to help them understand how to move beyond your circumstances and that you can do more and by putting more value in them, all 11 of those girls are graduating high school. And so we know that if we address what they need, it can be done, and so that our teachers can focus on just teaching them academically. Our teachers were designed to teach and help our kids move. And as community, we have to be designed to help them do more beyond the classroom so they can be prepared to go. So I just want to put that out of how helping them one-on-one -on -one and, and understanding what we say here do does work here if we're addressing their needs. Because a lot of kids, being an adult does not make you mature. 
And that's a lot of things I'm running into. Adults that are not mature, I don't want to hang with you and gossip with you. I'm almost 60. I don't have to hang and gossip with you. But I need to let you understand I'm your elder and I need to help you push in advance to do more. So that's what I want to just add to our table. Thank you. For the panelists, uh, yes, I saw the gentleman in the center in the black sweater. Oh, okay, can I stand? Hi, I'm Bill Hoffman. I'm a life skills coach with Project Act. And uh, in a room filled with so many movers and shakers, I am just moved to make this statement. Uh, there is a school in the Cleveland Metropolitan School District, a high school, that for years, <clears throat> has had the highest test scores in the district. Uh, for years, has had the highest percentage of graduates. For years, has had the highest percentage of graduates going to college. And for years, has had the highest percentage of graduates going to college, graduate from college. Cleveland School of the Arts. The Arts. Go figure. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to? Yep, right there. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Mai Moore, and I run a nonprofit called EYEJ, Empowering Youth Exploring Justice. And I just wanted to, two things, I just want to bring up, um, we have a youth council called the EYEJ Impact 25 Youth Council, and it answers some of the things that Merrill and Dr. Hutchins said, but um, we're really about amplifying youth voices. We work with predominantly Cleveland Metropolitan School District and very focused on social emotional learning. And our youth council is actually making um, a recommend, they've been tasked with making a recommendation to Chief Williams, um, the U.S. Attorney General's Office, commanders, members of Cleveland Indians on Monday. And you'll see it all throughout the Plain Dealer this weekend and on Monday. Um, but they, you know, through a very natural and authentic process, um, we asked them, you know, what, what, what do you want to do? How do you want to help Cleveland youth? And 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 what do you want to do? And they are focused on the two areas are on life skills and police youth relationships. So I think those are they're really really desperate for life skills in within the schools. So I just want to mention that. Um, but I actually have a question for you guys. Um, what do you guys think about the Say Yes for Education initiative? Could you just in a, briefly describe what that is? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Say Yes to Education is a national initiative that is, um, I'll start with this, it's likely, there's a, likely that it's coming to Cleveland. And Say Yes to Education uh, focuses on providing students with the supports they need to be successful in school and be on a path to college. And then once they get to the point where they are going to college, they are provided with a scholarship to help make their abilities and passions and desire to be in higher education a reality. So they use, they depend on a um, very sophisticated data-driven system to make sure that students are being provided with all of these sort of wraparound supports that students need to succeed when they are younger. Um, that includes having a social worker in all the schools. It includes making sure there is legal aid-esque support for families who might be having legal challenges. It's making sure that if students are having um, displaying, you know, negative behaviors that they can get the interventions before they end up getting suspended. Um, so it's really about trying to kind of expand what Cleveland's been doing with some of that wraparound modeling um, to make sure that all students have access to those those supports. Um, so I, I hope I did did the explanation justice. And um, I guess I'll speak from the higher education lens. Uh, what's great, or I, what, what is great about Say Yes to Education, should it end up coming here, is it does start those conversations around higher education earlier on. And because of the scholarship that students are eligible for, and it's a, there's many layers to that scholarship, so I'm not going to attempt to explain it um, right now. But it does give students hope, and it gives students a reason to work hard um, in high school because there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and at the end of the tunnel, there is a scholarship that can help make college or you know a reality for them. And also having this model and having being a say yes city, uh, 
it makes it that families are aware of um, of of their options. Um, there's a larger communication strategy around post-secondary education that can often lack. And something that we've struggled with in Cleveland is how do you start having these conversations and how do you kind of get that citywide um, recognition that you know your kid is you know is smart and can make it to college and we can help them do it. Um, so I think there's there's a lot of good things that come come with it. That would be. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of major um, urban cities are act. They've, they've, um, they actually have the Say Yes initiative in place, um, and I think it will be great for our business businesses here in the Cleveland area to support the schools. Um, the question is, are the business going businesses going to really show up to to one provide the funding for it because it's a very expensive program. Um, so they're going to have to make that financial commitment. Are they going to be able to make that financial commitment uh, to Cleveland Metropolitan School District? And then two, I think it can also be beneficial to bringing people back into the city of Cleveland. Like it's showing that, you know, we CMSD, you know, it gets a very negative kind of image out there. And I think sometimes people are missing some of the wonderful things that are happening in this city, how Cleveland is becoming one of the premier cities in this country. You know, people are looking at us to bring their businesses here. Um, so I, I feel that it could be a really good marketing tool uh, for, for the city as a whole to really validate the great educational experiences that can happen in, the, in Cleveland. Thank you. And I just want to say we've had a lot of excellent comments, but we'd like to prioritize questions. Thank you. My question actually is about parent engagement and parent education. I'd like to know what you all think about that because while you know, I know you're all very dedicated to what you do in trying to create change, unless someone in the home is there to support the child, you know, it just makes it all the more difficult. So I'd just like to hear your thoughts on that. I think it's very important that it, um, parents understand that they are the first and most important teacher their child will ever have. And parent engagement is something that uh, is very, very important when a child first goes to school and continues as the children go from grade to grade. When teachers have the ability to work with parents, they become a team. And uh, they really are able to encourage their students and work together to help that child become successful in school. So one of the things that um, I, I feel that parent engagement is very, very important, and now in many school districts, we have departments of family and children engagement. So parent engagement is very, very important, and the more we can stress that with our young high school students, that are beginning to think about parenthood and some of them who may be parents need to understand that they need to be involved in their children's education. So I have a unique perspective because I represent parents who don't feel engaged with the school. They feel that the school has not been providing the services for their children. And often I get in there and I see that it's a breakdown in communication between the school and the parents. Um, and also there is a lingering history of how this, the parents themselves were treated in school that leads them to be suspicious. Um, and every action the school takes to remind them of what happened when they were in school just builds a barrier between the school and the parent. So that's a lot of what we try to do is rebuild that barrier. Um, but it, it takes a recognition on the school side that the parent is, is trying to be an advocate for their child and that they may have some um, barriers themselves. And so it does sometimes take the school going that extra step to, to bridge that gap and that it's not always just simply reaching out but trying to understand what the where the parent's coming from. There's a lot of things I want to say, so I'm trying to be really brief. <laughs> um, so first of all, I think that a lot of times for educators uh, have a tendency to blame parents. And I think outside people also have a tendency to blame parents. And it's been my experience that parents, with the issues um, you just addressed, but it's also uh, parents are working like a tremendous amount of hours and don't always um, have the same hours that the school is available. And so I think it's really also important to recognize that if 
schools can't do everything. So if communities start to address issues around living wages, around access to health care and all these other issues that affect the families of our kids, I think then it makes it easier for the parents to engage. And I, I mean, obviously, the schools end has to understand all these issues. But I think there are a lot of larger issues that need to be addressed if you really want to engage every family and every parent. Because it's been my experience that parents want to be engaged. They just have all these other barriers that are from things that maybe the school is partly involved in, but things that the community or the city really needs to address. So, so I think for really young children, four, five, six, seven-year-olds, you really need, the parents need to be engaged. The child is so dependent on that home environment. But as children are getting older and in high school, for example, many parents will not be engaged, or they're engaged, but the home situation is so difficult that they, they can't be effectively engaged. Those children, those high school students, need professional help to help them go on in spite of what's going on in the home situation. And that's where having mental health professionals or life skills coaches to help the child go on in spite of that home environment is, is so important. So I, I used to be one of those educators that talked about parents and the parents needed to show up until I became a parent, right? Then I was like, oh, this is hard work. And I think at the end of the day, I re we really need to realize that parenting is very tough. And sometimes we just don't validate the fact, it's hard to raise children. Whether you're a single parent, and I don't know how single parents do, my mom was one of them, I still don't know how she did it with three kids. Um, but you know, one of our co-chairs of our executive our, of our equity task force, she's actually here today, Lisa. Uh, yeah, Vey, hey, where's Lisa um, out there? Because she reminds me this all the time. She's always like, "Our parents need to be our partners." Dr. Hutchings, say parents are partners. Say parents are partners. And now I'm saying parents need to be partners. And that is so important as we talk about, you know, meeting our students where they are, we have to meet our parents where they are as well. And we're all at different places because we all come from different walks of life. So it's our responsibility as, as school, you know, administrators um, or our family and community engagement centers that many school districts have now that we go and meet that parent where he or she is and we help them grow and we help them understand the importance of supporting their, their child's education. Okay, great. Thank you for the wonderful question. And thank you to the panelists. I'd like to thank you again for your engaging and informative presentations. And thank you for all being here. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, okay, moving along too fast. So if you have your final 10 second quick statements or takeaways that you'd like to provide the audience, we can start. Yeah. I'll go really fast because I didn't get through my presentation earlier. Um, <laughs> in my 10 seconds are up. So I just want to say we have to continue to advocate for our kids and we have to let them know that their voice is power. And that is a slogan that I constantly use. If everybody can just believe that and encourage our young people and tell them that they truly can be anything that they want in this world. And if you know how to read, you can learn how to do anything in this country. So reading truly is fundamental. Then this place will definitely be a better place. Identifying creative potential in young children, in all young children, is really important and nurturing it throughout the school years. And for young children, pretend play is one way to do that. So as much as I believe in education being a uh, mode of liberation, I also know that education is not enough to change the world, but hopefully education can change people and those people can go out and change the world. And I hope that all of us have gained an education today. I know I have. We need to keep kids in schools and help schools understand kids. It's all about options. We need to give our kids as many options as possible and getting them on a path to being ready for college and going to college helps to accomplish that goal. If we want to eliminate homelessness, the key is education, having our children be able to read and, and comprehend will really put them on a path where they can grow and become important citizens in our communities. 
we're all going to be experiencing deja vu. So I'd like to thank the panelists again for their informative and engaging presentations. And thank you all for coming to the Realizing Education Potential panel. And so just some housekeeping. There'll be a 15 minute break after this session. There are bathrooms on either side of this room. And if you're going to the relationship panel, it will be in ballroom C, this room. And if you're going to the home slash neighborhoods panel, it will be in ballroom A. Thank you for all being with us today. Thank you.